Um, hello, everyone. I'm Sally Anches, uh, Life Sciences Analyst at Water Tower Research. And today, um, I'd like to welcome Nicole Sanford, the CEO of Aspira Women's Health, um, for this fireside chat. Um, and she's going to uh, tell us a little bit about herself and the company, and then we'll um, do some Q&A on the technology and the products. So go ahead, Nicole. Right. Thanks, Sally. And uh, yeah. thanks for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, it's always always uh, a pleasure to get to talk a little bit about Aspira. Um, just by way of background, um, I joined the company as the CEO uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, before that, I was on the board. Uh, I was the audit committee chair. I, I became familiar with Aspira as an investor. First, I started investing in the company personally um, uh, back in 2019 uh, and, and ever since joined the company. Uh, my background is uh, in professional services. I was with Deloitte for almost 30 years. Uh, I was a, an audit partner in my early days, but then I went on to run a number of businesses for the firm and uh, and including a, a, some relatively large practices. But I became sort of known for being a startup and turnaround expert within uh, the firm and, and really working on our own businesses, growing them, transforming them. Uh, that that was kind of what I was known for. So since I joined a year and a half ago, I've recruited a whole new leadership team. Uh, I've really tried to focus on people that have uh, have demonstrated experience in the things we're trying to execute as a company, uh, which is was uh, accelerated growth and accelerated uh, pipeline development. And I'm really proud of the team I've put together uh, over the last 18 months. So um, Aspira is a diagnostic company, a NASDAQ listed company. Um, our focus is gynecological disease diagnostics. Um, we started with a focus on ovarian cancer uh, many years ago. We have uh, a decade plus of research supporting our technology. Uh, we have uh, multi-marker um, uh, blood tests for the identification of ovarian cancer already in the market, uh, uh, three different tests uh, in the market, commercially available, generating revenue, um, these tests uh, have been ordered more than 80,000 times since we launched them, uh, so we're really proud of that. And uh, we are also building the pipeline to include the first ever endometriosis blood test. So I know we're going to talk, get into more detail around the tests, but uh, that's a little bit about, about Aspira. Okay, thanks. Um, so maybe you could tell us more about the specific diagnostic tests that Aspira offers to the gynecologists. Um, and how they work to assess and monitor ovarian sure. cancer. Sure. So just stepping back a little bit uh, to understand why is ovarian cancer um, so hard to diagnose? Um, that's the most important question because that is why so many women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer actually pass away from the disease. Uh, most of the time it's found late stage when the survival rate is terrible. Uh, this is because it's it's really challenging to identify ovarian cancer using sort of traditional methods uh, for cancer identification. Uh, ultrasound alone is rarely conclusive. Um, we've done studies that show at least 50% of, uh, of um, nexal masses are um, indeterminate, meaning doctors can't identify the likelihood of a, of a malignancy based on just ultrasound and physical exam alone. So you have a very large percentage of these masses that, that appear in the pelvic um, region that um, doctors have no, uh, no ability to assess unless they actually remove the mass. You, mm -hmm. It's a liquid tumor. It can easily be ruptured by a needle for biopsy. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't work. So what we really needed to do was develop a diagnostic tool that by uh, measuring different biomarkers in the blood um, and by running all that information against an advanced algorithm, a proprietary algorithm, gives you a risk assessment that what you're looking at um, as an indexal mass is, is cancerous. So um, we have two tests. The first test, uh, OVA1 Plus, is actually a combination of two FDA cleared um, uh, 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 um, tests. That is used for surgical triage. That's a really important decision in the care for a woman with, an, with a mass who should do the surgery if the, if the mass is to be removed. Um, you have to be specially trained to remove an ovarian uh, malignancy so that you don't risk spreading it. Um, that test has been in the market for several years, has been showing sustained 20% plus growth every year. 
um, you know, is, is being adopted by physicians. And as I said before, has been run 80,000 times, which is a really um, mm -hmm. exciting mile, uh, milestone. Overwatch, which is a monitoring tool, uh, was launched in the fall of last year, December of last year. That is an exciting uh, blood test that's uh, using biomarkers, but also age and menopausal status. So it gives a personalized risk score um, for anexal masses that a doctor has not decided yet to make, uh, to deci decided to do surgery, but wants additional insight or needs additional insight about what they're looking at um, to kind of avoid the negative outcomes that we've seen, which is not only missing cancers, which is, you know, we know devastating, but also removing healthy ovaries because of a lack of reliable diagnostic tools. Um, so we believe Overwatch is going to offer physicians and patients a really compelling opportunity to look at data and making decisions about whether the, the ovary should be removed, uh, whether the mass is likely to be malignant, or whether they can take a watchful waiting approach and uh, and potentially monitor that. We're mm -hmm. we're excited to be um, be doing some additional research that we plan on publishing later this year to talk about how Overwatch can be used as a serial monitoring tool as well. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, and why why are these tools um, so important to patients, physicians, and payers? Yeah. Well, most importantly for patients, uh, we really want to help women get to a point where they're making decisions about their bodies based on science and data and not on fear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you start talking to women about this issue, in, invariably you will find women who say, oh, I had my ovaries removed because I had a mass and thank God there was no cancer there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that really is not the goal for, for right. you know, 2023, you should not be removing healthy organs. Mm -hmm. You should be leaving ovaries as long as possible. Um, you know, women have benefits to retaining their ovaries well into menopause. Um, but if you have your, your ovaries removed premenopausal, we know that that creates a number of long-term health risks that not only impact the care of the patient um, and the health of the patient, but also cost payers money. Um, unnecessary surgery, as well as, you know, long-term hormonal therapy, other health risks that materialize in, in these women who have their ovaries removed unnecessarily, um, heart disease, osteoporosis, and now recently um, a potential link to Parkinson's disease. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are some serious health and um, healthcare cost reasons to get much, much better at identifying healthy ovaries rather than just removing them just in case. Okay. Um, could you talk about reimbursement for these tests? Sure. So Ova One Plus, which is our uh, uh, the test that has been in the market since 2019, um, is uh, reimbursed uh, by Medicare. We have an LCD uh, at $897 per test, which is um, you know a nice margin for the test. We mm -hmm. have a, a wide range of commercial payers as well. Uh, uh, it, it, national coverage through Medicare Advantage is actually quite quite strong um, mm -hmm. as a result of the LCD. And since ovarian cancer affects uh, women uh, as they age, uh, mm -hmm. more likely to affect women as they age, yeah. that Medicare population is absolutely critical. Right. Um, but we also have um, been working hard to secure Medicaid coverage in various states um, and also to you know, increase the coverage of the test with uh, national payers, commercial payers as well. And Overwatch was just launched in December, but um, you know, we have, a, we have a unique PLA code for Overwatch, so we're billing under that PLA code effective on April 1st, um, oh. and that facilitates uh, reimbursement even with payers that don't we do not have a contract with. Um, oh. So, you know, that was a, a really significant achievement in pre-launch activity. Okay. And what sort of feedback have you gotten from physicians who are using this test um, on their patients? Yeah. Well, as I said before, we had research that showed that up to 50% of, um, of cases are indeterminate, and physicians are um, trying desperately to treat those patients in the best way possible. They don't want to send a woman who doesn't need surgery to surgery, and they certainly don't want to send home uh, as potentially benign a woman who has a malignancy. So for them to have access to Overwatch, which is, is, is there is no other test that does what Overwatch does. Overwatch is, a, is in a population of one, um, which is really to give a personalized risk score for a woman with an anexal mass 
So what we've heard from doctors, it has been very favorable. Um, now the, the answer is, um, you know, before we only had a test they could use when they were sending somebody to surgery, but now we have a test for them to use anytime a woman comes in uh, mm -hmm. with an inexal mass. And that is a real game changer. Uh, mm -hmm. And so far the, the feedback's positive. I do think that, um, and based on the research that we've done with physicians previously, that when we are able to market this test as a serial monitoring test, based on the clinical data that we are uh, continue to collect, that's going to um, become even more valuable for physicians because what it's telling them is, you know, you can, you can do this initial clinical assessment with mm -hmm. the test and then have the patient come back periodically over a certain amount of time right. um, and, and uh, have additional comfort that you have not missed a malignancy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think that when that, when that milestone is met and we're able to go out and market the test that way, mm -hmm. we're going to see an even more rapid adoption and positive um, response from the market. Okay. Um, and um, uh, are, are you aware of any other um, liquid biopsy companies that have an ovarian cancer test like Garden Health or Abbott? So there are other companies that have been working on what I'll call high-risk screening tests or multi-cancer screening tests. Those are screened. Oh. What well, we have is not a screen. What yes, we have yeah. developed is for women who have presented with an inexal mass, and therefore they have a medical reason to have an additional mm -hmm. assessment um, mm -hmm. done. The ACOG guidelines are very clear that when a woman presents with an inexal mass, the physician should do an additional um, risk assessment. So there isn't mm -hmm. anyone that has a test like Overwatch. Mm -hmm. um, in the That's past, what doctors yeah. have used is um, you know, a, a single biomarker test called CA125, which um, really oh. was never developed to be used right. the way it had been used. But in the absence of anything else, physicians would use CA125. Um, mm. All of our research and really most research shows that, um, you know, while CA125, which was originally developed to be a recurrence monitoring um, yeah. tool, huh. um, and, it, and it does not work as well as a initial clinical assessment tool. Um, however, we also do give physicians um, a, an individual CA-125 score in every test. So they don't have to give up the CA-125 um, biomarker data that they had before. They're gonna still have access to that through our report. Um, there is nothing else available on the market for, for physicians to, uh, to do an initial clinical assessment of a mass. Um, so, you know, we're, we're very, very excited to be in a population really of one. Right. Okay, good. Um, I know you, you had some abstracts presented at this year's ASCO. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what the feedback and interest level was? Yeah. Yeah. So our, our, our abstracts were actually published um, uh, on the ASCO um, website as part okay. of the, um, it, but we did not present. Uh, oh, however, okay. We have been, um, you know, obviously talking to physicians uh, about the data. Uh, the research continues to to support the clinical validity of Overwatch um, and exciting information. We keep seeing uh, mm -hmm. the power of the test. It, it, it keeps expanding. So, for example, in talking to some physicians um, about the power of having this uh, this expanded tool set of OvaSuite. Um, which is how we refer to um, refer to the test mm. together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a significant backlog of uh, for surgery surgeries with gynecologic oncologists. Mm. Um, and why does that matter? Uh, it's because women who actually do need to have surgery because they have a likely malignancy are being forced to wait while these doctors who are highly trained and highly skilled at removing malignancies. Um, mm -hmm. take out benign ovaries, like to the tune of hundreds of thousands of them, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, doctors who um, ha have those backlogs are extremely excited to have a tool that they can use with the um, referring physicians mm -hmm. to do a better job of understanding, you know, what they're looking at, right? So so that that's one of the things that we found in, in some of the research that we've done. We've also looked at um, the opportunity to reduce surgeries, as I said before, uh, for low-risk women, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're looking forward to having even more data around serial monitoring, which is also part of what we've been mm -hmm. uh, presenting. Okay. Thanks. Um, and uh, why why is Aspira focusing on endometriosis? Sure. Um, yeah. 
tell, tell us more about it and um, why doctors need you know better clinical tools. Yeah. Find well, it. starting with that last question first, um, you know, endometriosis is a, a is a debilitating disease. Um, you know, there's estimates as high as six million women, American women, um, wow. suffering from endometriosis. Um, it is a unique disorder in that um, you're not looking for tissue that is foreign to the body. Mm. What you have is tissue that's actually meant to be in the body, but meant to stay in the uterus that for okay. some reason has um, escaped <laughs> and nobody yeah. really understands why this happens, how it happens. There's been some interesting new research uh, hmm. on this topic. Um, but what happens is it continues to behave the same way outside of the uterus that it pre as it behaved when it was inside of the uterus, which means at various points in a woman's cycle, and for some very unfortunate women, it happens all the time, hmm. um, you know, it will cause pain as it, oh. it um, you know, does its job. Uh, in, in, but it'll be somewhere else in your body. And that's not, that's not what you want. So women will have debilitating pain and left untreated long-term could actually lose their fertility uh, as endometriosis oh. um, can, uh, can affect the ability to conceive later if it's left mm -hmm. untreated. Um, you know, we, we find endometriosis in, in very young women. Oh. Uh, so, you know, it's a different population. As I said earlier, ovarian cancer focuses more on, on, okay. um, you know, is, is higher risk as you age. Mm -hmm. uh, this is almost the flip side where, um, you know, you'll know by the time you're menopausal clearly that if you had, a, um, um, uh, if you had endometriosis. So what we gain, the knowledge that we gained as we developed these advanced algorithms for ovarian cancer, um, you know, made us really uniquely qualified to understand how to build a tool for endometriosis. Um, a lot of the benign um, samples that we used to validate the ovarian cancer test, for example, were um, endometriosis. So we had a fabulous biobank mm. to start with. We had okay. a lot of um, collaboration with um, some of pharma partners who are developing, uh, who have uh, tests uh, for, or have uh, drugs, sorry, for endometriosis. So, you know, we had the expertise, we had access to samples, um, mm -hmm. and we we recognized some patterns um, in our research for ovarian cancer that made it um, made it possible for us to turn our attention to endometriosis. So, um, you know, we are really excited that we are in the final stages mm -hmm. of um, of the commercialization process for okay. the very first ever uh, blood mm -hmm. test for endometriosis and expect to have something, uh, a first generation commercial test available and in the market by the end of the year. Wow. Um, how, how is it currently diagnosed? I'm just um, through a, a, a laparoscopic procedure. Oh, okay. yeah. So there is no non-invasive way to diagnose endometriosis. As a result, a lot of women will choose not to go forward with that invasive procedure right. and they just go undiagnosed. Mm. Um, you know, it takes between, um, you know, anywhere from five to nine years on average for a woman right. to be properly diagnosed with endometriosis. Wow. Um, it, and the, the, um, the symptoms can be confused with a lot of other things as mm. well. So sometimes doctors will um, have a woman go through a process of elimination for other things that it could be before mm -hmm. they subject um, or recommend a laparoscopic procedure. Okay. Um, it does it cause pain? Is it painful? Very painful. Oh, really? Oh. Very painful. Yeah. So women will report that they, you know, they will lose. Um, there was an uh, there was a recent study about the economic impact of endometriosis, mm -hmm. and women reported um, routinely missing work. Um, mm -hmm. losing jobs. Um, okay. You know, it's a very uh, serious condition. Okay. And um, what, uh, what are, you, you mentioned that there are some treatments. What are some treatments for it? I mean, are there approved drugs to treat yeah, it? Yeah, there are. There are actually, there's a lot of um, great innovation happening in terms of drug therapies for endometriosis, um, which, which is actually creates even more of a need for our, uh, our test. Um, oh. because, you know, if, if a, a physician would like to prescribe one of these, um, new drug therapies, um, Abby has a, has a drug that's been on the market for some oh. time. Myovant has a drug that's been on the okay. market, um, that's FDA approved in the market. And yeah. I'm aware of several others that are in development, um, oh. in order okay. to, to prescribe that and have confidence that it's going to be paid for by payers, oh. we need a definitive diagnosis, need diagnosis, right. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of support. 
Uh, mm -hmm. That's why we were able to actually get a, a nice collaboration with a number of these um, pharmaceutical companies to oh. uh, provide us with samples to help advance the, the research. Oh, okay. Uh, and we, we have a clinical study that's ongoing right now that will support the launch. Um, you know, what I'm really excited about is, um, you know, we are continuing the validation of this test in the same lab where we will launch it commercially. Uh, oh, so once we have the validation complete, we'll be ready to launch um, pretty quickly. Oh, okay. Good. Um, yeah, and endometriosis is actually getting quite a bit of attention um, oh, more broadly. Yeah. It, there was there were provisions in the omnibus spending bill um, this mm -hmm. year for uh, endometriosis research and around not just um, treatment but also diagnosis. Um, just this last week, uh, the state of Connecticut, where Aspire is based, um, mm -hmm. announced a, a bill that was passed to fund endometriosis research and, mm. and help to identify early. So, you know, women are really clamoring for advancements mm -hmm. here. Um, it's a different kind of market um, in terms mm -hmm. of it's same same call point, OBGYNs, yeah. but um, with ovarian cancer, which which we don't believe is really ever going to be something that's sort of pushed by um, the consumer market, it'll be prescribed by the physicians and the right. situations yeah. that occur. Given the just the sheer numbers of women that that have endometriosis and mm. the countless others who think they have it, yeah. because the symptoms are so nebulous, um, mm -hmm. we think there could be a really compelling pull, consumer pull for that test. Wow. Um, so we're really excited about that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and how have you weathered uh, the challenges of the current market and economic um, challenges? So as, as I said at the beginning, um, I'm sort of known for my execution style, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, when I came into the company, there really wasn't a need to, to you know, throw out the strategy and start over. We had the right strategy. We had the right technology. Mm -hmm. What we did need to do is, um, you know, get much more focused on the, the two or three things we really needed to do to advance the enterprise value of the company and mm. to get our pipeline moving and ramp up our commercial um, mm -hmm. growth. So, you know, last year was a transformation year. Um, we really had to take a hard look at all of our spend, make sure that we were not spending in advance of business need, uh, make sure that we were calibrating for the growth of the company. Um, we were able to significantly reduce um, spending um, and while well, simultaneously growing sales, mm -hmm. which is usually right. not the way it goes mm -hmm. and accelerating um, R&D, but, you know, the market conditions are uh, in, from a from a market perspective are challenging. Um, but we know that um, there are a lot of companies out there that probably um, sci scientifically and otherwise weren't ready to be public companies um, unfortunately, they're mm -hmm. sort of caught up in this. That's not who we are. We have FDA cleared tests. We have mm -hmm. revenue generating products. Um, you know, we just have to stay focused on executing our strategies, stay focused on growing the business the best we can and being prudent in how we spend resources. Right. And that's going to be how we can really distinguish ourselves. Okay. Yeah. Um, you did do some substantial cost cutting, um, yes. recently. And so it's, you know, good to see that you're very budget conscious and yeah, absolutely. We we reduced the headcount by thirty plus percent, and and of course that's never an easy decision to make. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know we really were able to continue to execute um, mm -hmm. with the much leaner team. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and so we were able to do that, which was which was really exciting. That's we really also cool. focused on um, pulling back on some of the marketing. Uh, in the past, I think there was a lot of a lot more sort of consumer facing marketing for the ovarian cancer product, which, quite frankly, I wasn't seeing the ROI. So we pivoted uh -huh. more to direct to physician marketing. Right. You know, you obviously don't see an immediate impact of that. That takes some time to to really capture. But um, we saw that even though we cut um, sales and marketing expenses by um, by quite a bit, mm -hmm. we were still able to continue to capture more market share. And, and we're poised to do more of that, um, yeah. especially as the serial monitoring test is launched later this year. Right. Okay, good. Um, uh, what, what do you think, what does the future hold for Aspira? 
Yeah. So this year, it, it's going to be all about driving um, commercial adoption of uh, the ovarian cancer test okay. uh, portfolio, the OvaSuite portfolio, mm -hmm. um, and launching EndoCheck. It's it's going to really be about uh, positioning our commercial products um, for for success mm -hmm. um, and continuing to innovate around sales and marketing. Um, we still have we still have work to do there, but I, mm -hmm. I'm happy with the progress we've made. We've got more to do, um, mm -hmm. and that's going to be a really important focus for us this year. So as we go okay. into 24, you know, you kind of look back at 22 as transform. This is really continue to execute and prepare, and 24 mm -hmm. is going to be the breakout year for us. So uh, we're very excited to to continue to execute the rest of the year. You know, right. one thing that that I hope is in my future is more women investors. Um, right. I tell people all the time, I have great investors. They've been, um, they understand the business. They understand the potential. They've been with us um, for the long haul, but mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of women investors. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I don't like to be labeled as a women's health company. We're a technology company. Right. We are mm -hmm. a real, we are a real um, a commercially focused uh, and serious scientific company. Okay. Um, but we do, in fact, um, focus on gynecologic disease. And I'd really like to see women uh, come into the stock and, and join the right. men who have been so supportive of the company. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I hope when I talk to you this time next year, yeah. I can tell you I've been more successful mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in attracting female investors. <laughs> so Good. Yeah. Hopefully this will help me do that. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, is there anything else that um, you would like to address here or? Well, I just really appreciate the opportunity um, to come and, and talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, yes, this is a really challenging time for any company in our, right. uh, in our space, but um, mm -hmm. I've probably never been as optimistic as I am now that we are on the right path. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and if you have if you have good products that meet an unmet need, right. um, you will be successful. So mark, we're yeah. just, um, you mm -hmm. know, keep, I've, I've built a great team that I, I really respect and that really good. respects each other. Mm -hmm. um, these are successful executives. They could have gone anywhere, mm -hmm. but they did their research just like I did and said, mm -hmm. this company is set to explode. And they yeah. came in and now we're working, you know, seamlessly towards a single goal, which is to improve the gynecologic health of women Right. Um, everywhere. So we're excited. Good. Well, I definitely enjoy uh, seeing your progress and watching. I appreciate that, Sally. I know you've been, you've known the company for a while. I know that. Yes, so. I have. So, <laughs> so uh, I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate the background. Definitely. Um, okay. Well, um, if you don't have anything else, then um, I think we will end this. And again, I thank you so much for spending some time with me today and to our listeners. No, it's um, my pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Sure. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.